Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, the U.S. colony of Guam, our guest, Chris Gillardi, is a New York City-based journalist. His work appears in The Nation, The Intercept, and The Appeal, among other publications. His recent article in The Nation is called Guam, Resisting Empire at the, quote, Tip of the Spear. Chris Gillardi, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you so much for having me. Good to be here. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for writing all the articles you've been writing. Um, can you, you catch people up who, who haven't been paying attention, just a brief background on the United States and Guam? How did we get to this point? Sure, yeah. Um, so I guess an abridged history is uh, we obtained Guam um, in 1898 during the Spanish-American War when we were kind of just taking over um, this waning Spanish Empire's territories. We took Guam, the Philippines, and Puerto Rico. Um, and then for 40 years up until World War II, there was um, a naval administration on Guam. So it wasn't, it was just kind of like a, a de facto U.S. territory that the Navy oversaw. Um, and then Japan overtook Guam for a few years during World War II. And then after that, the U.S. took Guam back. Um, and it's been a quote unquote unincorporated territory ever since, um, which just means colony. Um, so the, the Constitution doesn't fully apply on Guam like it does on U.S. states, and the U.S. kind of uses it as um, more or less like a military outpost because it's in a very strategic location about two-thirds of the way into the Pacific, so it's pretty close to um, Korea, uh, Japan, China, and all that, so it, it's acted as a strategic military outpost ever since, and now there's a, a naval base and an air force base and um, a lot of key military positions in Guam. In fact, didn't Japan uh, take over Guam on December 7th, 1941, along with numerous other islands and nations on a day that we refer to as Pearl Harbor Day, as if that were the one and only place uh, that was attacked? Yeah, it is. Uh, um, yes, so Japan did take Guam um, on the same day as we would refer to as Pearl Harbor Day. And this kind of gets into the... Um, sort of weird politics of U.S. territories, whether they're considered popularly as part of the U.S. or not. Um, but yeah, it wasn't just Hawaii that um, Japan attacked on in December 1941. It was Guam, and it was uh, close to a dozen other U.S. and British um, colonies, but we don't hear about those as much. Yeah, and many of which Japan didn't leave anytime soon, yeah. <laughs> where yeah. Pearl Harbor was just a flyby. Um, and so then in 1944, the U.S., military takes back Guam uh, and takes a good bit of, of the land of, of the island, right? Yeah, so the I guess an important note is the like Japanese occupation of Guam, which was three years, um, and they also held um, the Northern Mariana Islands, which is another U.S. territory along the same archipelago for about that time, um, is a very, it's the indigenous people's like one of the darkest times in their history, even though the U.S. Uh, naval administrations before that were very colonial and very, um, you know, bad and uh, rife with civil rights abuses, uh, there was, it was pretty horrific, the Japanese occupation. Um, what, like, beheadings and forced labor and all of that. So even though the U.S., um, you know, the program was extremely colonial and bad before the Japanese, um, when the U.S. retook Guam in 1944. They're kind of like welcomed with open arms as as, as liberators, um, one would say. Um, and so, yeah, so after that, the U.S. kind of took back much of Guam's land. Um, and since then, has the DOD has owned between like half and a third of Guam's land um, to use for these these military bases. And, and a lot of that has resulted in family lands, family farms, um, family ranches being taken away from the indigenous people who are known as the Chamorros. Uh, yeah, so it's, it, the, the DOD has held um, much of Guam just for military purposes since World War II. And you, you noted in your article in The Nation, Chris Gillardi, that the U.S. military uh, at some points has given some of this land to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service mm -hmm. uh, rather than giving it to the people who own the land. Yeah, that's kind of a theme. So as the U.S. has, um, as it really consolidated its military capabilities on Guam, but it's consolidated 
um, the areas which it needs specifically for bases. Um, but instead of giving the land back to uh, the indigenous residents of Guam or to the Guam government or something, it's kind of either held it. So there's a lot of DOD land on Guam that is been just kind of like empty and the DOD isn't using it all, which is part of um, the way that the DOD can um, do this military buildup that I think we're going to talk about in a second. Um, but if they don't keep it themselves, they've given it to other federal uh, agencies like the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which keeps some of the land, again, like land that was pre-World War II owned by the indigenous people, um, but now is just, they don't have access to it except for, you know, when it's like a public park during certain times of day. Yeah, so, what, so what, uh, what's the extent of the military buildup and, and in recent years with the pivot to Asia and the hostility toward China? What is the, what is the new buildup of the U.S. military on Guam? So the buildup on Guam has been in the works for a very long time. Um, we can, you can trace it back to uh, when in the 90s the military decided to shut down Futenma, Air ba Futenma Marine Air Base in Okinawa, um, which is still ongoing. That's a whole project that's been decades in the making. Um, but the whole kind of impetus for this big military buildup going, going on Guam is to relocate some Marines from Okinawa to Guam. So Guam would then have an Air Force presence, a Navy presence, a small army presence and a whole marine base. Um, and so this is again, like the military bureaucracy is so slow. So it's been in the works for a few decades, but the goal is to bring about 5,000 Marines uh, to 5,000 new Marines to Guam. And for that, they'll need um, new barracks. They'll need this uh, big live fire training range in the north, which um, is resulting in the destruction of a lot of the native forests. Um, they're creating a new aircraft birthing station, or like an aircraft carrier birthing station at the naval base, which will destroy a lot of coral reefs um, and a few other smaller facilities that I'm not really thinking of right now. Um, yeah, so it's this big military buildup. The, the stated impetus is to relocate Marines from Okinawa to Guam, but it's also very clearly like a China-facing buildup um, to get Marines onto Guam and to beef up um, this like tip of the spear, which is, is what the nickname for Guam is for the military. And, and, and so part of this is the build up and escalation from the US in the Pacific, but some bit of it, uh, as you mentioned, is in part the result, I think, of, of the resistance of the people of Okinawa mm -hmm. and the, the choice to send some of the troops from Okinawa somewhere else, somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, and the thinking that, that, that they could be imposed on Guam without the same level of resistance, right? Yeah, yeah. And so a lot of this stems from the very inspiring resistance that's been taking place on Okinawa um, since, I mean, for forever, but in, in a movement level since the 90s. Um, but it's all kind of um, just like, like to use the term relocation, which, which is what the military loves to use, is a little bit of a misnomer. Um, one, because uh, when like enclosing the Futenma Air ba Marine Air Base in Okinawa, they're building a new Marine Air Base in Okinawa um, called Hinoko. And they're also, um, yeah, re trying to like say that they're relocating these Marine capabilities to Guam, but net it's it's a bit of a, like a build up, like, like there will be more military capabilities in this region facing China, um, yeah, from, from this relocation in including yeah ongoing major presence in okinawa yeah. but also the northern marianas and micronesia mm -hmm. and marshall islands and palau i mean it's, it's across the whole any bit of land that hasn't gone underwater yet right yeah and this is kind of like the latest development i think we're seeing like the the, the base kind of shifting in okinawa has been in the works for decades um, this Guam buildup has been in the works for about 20 years. Like you said, there's also they're also hoping to um, create a, a new Air Force kind of diversion base, like a secondary base in the Northern Mariana Islands on the same archipelago as Guam. They're also hoping to, this isn't finalized yet, but hoping to use a um, an island, like an island that was only recently uninhabited 
in the Northern Marianas for a bombing range, just to like use the entire island as a bombing range. Um, so that that stuff has kind of been in the works for a few years. But yeah, now recently you're starting to see, um, like in the federal state, Federated States of Micronesia, which is a, a multi-island nation, um, pretty in the region, pretty close by. Um, the U.S. military has. There's not many details on this yet, but they're planning to build a new base. Um, the outgoing president of the Republic of Palau, which is another Micronesian island nation, um, asked a year ago for um, a new military base there, which is like the closest um, set of islands in Micronesia to like Taiwan and China. Um, so that might be in the works. There's some rumblings among Democratic lawmakers in Congress about taking that ask more seriously and doing a buildup on Palau. Um, and there's also some um, facilities already in the Marshall Islands. Um, there's like some ballistic missile facilities and some space debris monitoring facilities. So yeah, it's really now with kind of like this, now that Obama has um, supposedly pulled out of Afghanistan and is really able to um, Obama. I'm sorry. Biden <laughs> is. <laughs> they they both. It, it, in fairness, they both supposedly pulled out of Afghanistan. Yeah. At one point. <laughs> supposedly so. Uh, yeah. Um, and is like pivoting to Asia more in earnest. Um, you're going to see this buildup of forces in Micronesia. Yeah. And but these proposals to turn whole little islands into bombing ranges have been opposed even by big environmental groups that ordinarily won't say a word against militarism and its environmental impact um but i guess the uh, plans are still moving ahead yeah and it's i i find it interesting this is something i hope i'm hoping to do a little bit more reporting on um i find the politics surrounding it very interesting um because you, the president of the um republic of micronesia has dodged a lot of the militarism questions and framed a new u.s military base as something that will help in, I guess you would call it like their like infrastructure issues. Like um, he cited um, some like new Coast Guard capabilities that, that a military base, base would bring. Um, he's also cited, ironically cited um, like climate change resilience as a reason to bring in the US military, which is one of the worst emitters of greenhouse gases in the world. Um, yeah, so it, it's it's kind of this weird thing where these like tiny island nations are trying to balance like a um, an aversion to militarism with sort of a hope or, or a need to appeal to the superpower that really just wants to militarize them. Yeah, and and on Guam, there's there's mixed response as everywhere, right? There are people with with jobs and income directly from uh, and indirectly from the military and supporting it and remembering the, the stories of the Japanese occupation being worse. But there are people who who object to their to their family lands being taken and to the to the occupation of the whole country, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there is a very wide and like diversely populated political spectrum um, when it comes to militarism on Guam. Um, so a lot of like much of the embrace of the U.S. military does stem from this um, very palpable and often referenced generational trauma. Um, from the Japanese occupation in World War II. Like when I talked to some sources who were more on the like the pro-military side of, of the spectrum, um, everyone is a little bit pro-military and I think a little bit um, skeptical. I they're, Everyone kind of like holds these two thoughts at once. Um, but people who are more towards the pro-military side of the spectrum, um, yeah, would, would readily reference the, the Japanese occupation of Guam and um, readily reference the idea that the U.S. has acted as a liberator on Guam, even though it is also the occupier and also the colonizer. Um, and yeah, like you said, the like once once um, the military kind of gets embedded in a small place like this, it pretty much dominates the economy. Um, so it's hard to to divorce those things, and it takes it would take a lot of work to plan a small island economy that is dominated by the military with like without the military's presence. And so a lot of people can like lean into that. Like you see this everywhere. I'm not just on like small islands. You see this in the United States, um, leaning into a, an economy of the military um, in a way that doesn't so much question it as, as um, invite more militarism for the economic benefits. 
and there are also environmental consequences, mm -hmm. right, of all of these bases and all of their pollution. And, and presumably, as everywhere else, they hold themselves above accountability and the rule of law in terms of what they do to the environment. Yeah. So there's a really pernicious history of military toxicity, specifically on Guam, throughout the Pacific. I know you had John Mitchell on a, a while ago, and he wrote a whole book about this, yeah. um, which is really horrifying. Um, but yeah, specifically on Guam, there's um, like uh, there's one part where um, part of like the indigenous resistance stems from the realization that the military um, had been poisoning the the aquifer, the main aquifer on Guam, with something called trichloroethylene, which is like a cleaning solvent that is a common contaminant on military bases. And the military knew about this for like eight years in the 70s and 80s, but didn't tell anybody until someone came across this report. Um, so is that there's also um, a lot of evidence that the same chemicals used in Agent Orange was used as just a standard um, herbicide on Guam to clear like fence lines and pipelines. And the military has denied this for a long time. And it's only recently that veterans groups are getting them, um, getting them and the VA to recognize the use of Agent Orange chemicals on Guam and the poisonings that resulted from that. Um, and so there's that history that's kind of playing into this military buildup. A lot of the activists on Guam now, that's their main concern, is uh, just the, the use of chemicals and the, the, the lack of, of reporting around those chemicals. Um, one of the more recent um, efforts by the indigenous groups is to call attention to um, the possibility that uh, live fire training ranges, which is one of the main facilities they're building on Guam, um, can leak uh, like heavy metal toxins into um, you know water sources. And the area where they're building this live fire training range is covered in like a very porous um, limestone. That's like the the ground beneath it. So kind of everything that you have on that live fire range seeps into the aquifer. And the military hasn't really acknowledged any of this in any of its studies or any of the mandated reports that it has to create. Um, and so, yeah, so there, there's a lot of like distrust surrounding the uh, yeah, toxicity uh, on, of these military bases. Has the, has the problem of these so-called forever chemicals, PFAS chemicals, cropped up on, on Guam as elsewhere around the world with U.S. bases? Definitely. Um, I, the, I think the reporting and the studies on that are a little bit behind. I could only find some stuff um, that kind of like hinted at some the contamination related to PFAS. Um, but yeah, that is definitely a concern. Another concern is um, PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, which are uh, um, kind of just like an industrial chemical that, that leaks from a lot of these military facilities. Um, there's some studies to show that PCBs on Guam from Coast Guard and uh, standard military facilities have um, caused spiked cancer rates in, in a lot of the areas on Guam. We're speaking with Chris Gillardi, and his article in The Nation is Guam Resisting Empire at the Tip of the Spear. Um, you, you tell the story of some people in the article uh, who have to go through a U.S. military base to get to land that has been left to them as their land, but they, they don't have any other way to get to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and this seems to create some, some resentment as well, right? Yeah, it was really surprising whenever I would speak to people with family history on Guam, mostly indigenous people, um, how casually we would be like on a hike or just walking around somewhere and being like, oh yeah, my family land is over there. or Oh, my friend's family land is over there. And it's like a US military site. Um, so it's very common. The, the first person I tell um, in the story, her name is Monica Flores, and her family's land was at the northern tip of Guam, which is near this, where this uh, live fire training range complex is being built. And when the military kind of like was doing its like post-World War II land grab, it took the area directly south of it for an Air Force base and then took the area directly north of it um, and that's the area that you're talking about that was handed over to the U.S. Um, wildlife Refuge. And there's only one way to get into the land, which is like now just a sliver. They took a lot of it, but like left some of it for the family. Um, so it's sandwiched between these two places. And the only way to get to it is through the military base, uh, through the Air Force base. So Monica and 
her family like have to get security clearance, the procedures of which are constantly changing. Um, they have to, like, if they want to bring friends onto the land, uh, they have to get them cleared through security. Um, and it's just like a pretty typical occupation scene, like where you have to go through a militarized gate to get into your family land. It's really, it's a, it's Palestine reminiscent. I was going to say, it's like living in Palestine. Uh, and so what is the, the state of the resistance organizing activism on Guam and what at least some partial successes they've had, I think? Definitely. So when um, the military published its first um, big study report of the plans um, for these new military facilities, Back in 2009, it sparked a very big um, mobilization among certain indigenous groups. Um, a bunch of kind of like, like a ragtag group, I would say, of, of Chamorro activists got together and formed this group called We Are Guahan. And what they did was they read through um, the entire, it's called an in environmental impact statement. Um, they read through the entire environmental impact statement, which is full of um, jargon and scientific terminology and is incredibly long and very difficult to to read through if you weren't the one compiling it but they went through it line by line and organized this um, big public information campaign um, and public comment campaign because the military is supposed to solicit comment um, when it publishes a draft of these environmental impact statements so they did that and they got like ten thousand comments and so this was back in 2009 to 2012 ish um, and so it became very clear, like the military, I think, expected kind of just an acquiescence and a welcoming of this buildup, but it, it was soon very clear to them that, um, yeah, that, that a lot of indigenous groups were, were not going to have it. Um, but, you know, the military bureaucracy goes on. And so originally the, the plan was for about 8,600 Marines, a lot bigger kind of presence, more facilities, and they just kind of like tamped it down to 5,000 Marines created a new environmental impact statement. And I, you know, that's just kind of how the military steamrolls activism. It's, it's a slow bureaucracy and it just kind of does its thing and makes minor adjustments. Um, so that's, that's where it is right now. And they have a new environmental impact statement and they've, they've already started construction and stuff. And so, um, yeah, we are Gohan did its thing. And then since then, uh, many of the members of that activist group have come into like positions of, of power, I would say, um, some of them are in government. The One of the founding members of this group it was elected attorney general and sued um, the Navy over um, like an environmental, a separate environmental issue and is hoping to do that a little bit more. Um, so it really sparked something that is, is pretty inspiring and um, yeah, will create a little bit of hell for the military, but it's still, the military is one of the powerful, most powerful institutions in the world and it's still... Um, you know, churning on despite the increased resistance. That that reduction in the increase in the number of Marines sounds very similar to the number of Marines that they decided to send into Australia. Uh, any connection? Yeah, so the... Um, yes, the original plan was to have like 8,600 Marines plus all of their um, dependents like living permanently on Guam. And I'm not exactly sure what the breakdown is now, but with the 5,000 Marines, a lot of them are going to be rotating through, um, including rotating through Australia. So, um, yeah, like Australia, Okinawa, and Guam are kind of like in a sort of Marine triangle where, where the military is trying to like find the right balance, I think, while still having as many troops as possible in the region. It, 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 se it seems like every anti-base success uh, almost uh, results in a new base somewhere else. Uh, if we don't have the whole world organized, uh, it, it's hard to have a win that's an actual reduction, isn't it? Yes, that's a great point. And I think this is like a, a conversation point I've had so many times since the piece was published that, um, yeah, it's, it's hard to kind of it's it's hard to create solidarity when it can be like a zero sum game like if you succeed in expelling the um like troops from Okinawa and they go immediately to Guam that then it's kind of like it's creating kind of I think a fight between activists in certain places um and so yeah and I, I think that's something that it's no it's definitely something 
that activists have been addressing over the past few years and trying to create um, like cross cultural coalitions. And so I know like activists in Guam and the Northern Marianas have been talking to Okinawan activists a lot. They've all been talking to Micronesian activists a lot. And I, um, I would think that there's, there's kind of like some effort for a united solidarity, solidarity to address the fact that, yeah, the U.S. can pit these places against one another. Yeah. It's, uh, we've got just a few minutes left. It, it, Chris Gilardi, it, it seems like the buildup pre-World War II on all these islands by the U.S. military, where it was the U.S. and China against Japan, uh, is now being really repeated uh, with U.S. and Japan against China uh, and with more troops and worse weapons mm -hmm. uh, and very little, if any, memory uh, that the buildup to World War II ever even happened. Mm -hmm. uh, there's this story about Pearl Harbor as if it came out of a blue sky and there was no, you know, no buildup to war happening between the U.S. and Japan for, for decades prior. Um, can anything be done to wake people up to the notion that maybe this would be a mistake not to make again? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's, it's something, like, you know, like reporters like me and, and, and media like you kind of like try to like scream out into the void, like in the in the early stages of these kind of things. Um, but it's it's hard to get a little bit of traction. I think history is very informative here. Um, I, I'm, I'm focusing on Micronesia right now, so I'll use that as an example. Like um, like in the Marshall Islands, where there's a base right now and um, in the region where there's this like pretty imminent buildup of China facing forces um, like it was devastated in like the 50s and 60s by US nuclear tests um, and a lot of these islands were devastated during World War II during these like wars between two empires and so the destruction is already like we don't it's it's not like the pre-World War II buildup where where there wasn't it was kind of like a new phenomenon we know what happens when empires go to war and we know what happens when there are these big unquestioned buildups and it, it involves destruction, it involves death, um, it involves environmental destruction and, it was, and that's happening right now in the midst of climate change where these islands are incredibly vulnerable. Um, so yeah, I think as much as we can point to history and be like, this has happened before and it probably shouldn't happen again, um, the, the more successful I think that kind of messaging can be. Uh, I am confident you are right, and I highly recommend uh, people read this article from The Nation magazine called Guam Resisting Empire at the Tip of the Spear. We've been speaking with the author Chris Gilardi, who is a New York City-based journalist. His work is in The Nation, The Intercept, The Appeal, and other publications. Uh, go and check those out. Uh, Chris Gilardi, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you, thank you so much for having me. It was great. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.